Good morning. We come from busy lives. No. Please rise in body or spirit for the responsive call to worship. And I'm trying to get God of stillness. We come from busy lives and surrender them to your grace. You are the home of our hearts. We come with all our memories and feelings, alliances and attachments. You are the home of our hearts. We come amidst all our swirling desires and emotions to find ourselves. You are the home of our hearts. Here we find ourselves in you, every part of us, and all of us together. You give yourself to us, and we give ourselves to you. In joy, we worship you. Hallelujah.
to us from the letter to the Ephesians. Put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Let us begin by confessing our sins, first in silence. And now, together, living God, thank you for reworking us to become more like Jesus. We confess that we resist this work in us. We copy our old selves and our comfortable clothes. We want the renewing of us, but often it hurts, so we easily slide back into old habits. We are reluctant to speak the truth for fear of offending, or our anger gets the better of us, and we lash out. We easily convince ourselves that we deserve a little more. Why work hard when you can see it? We let cruel words slip out of our mouths, disguised as humor or opinion. Holy God, we confess that we have grieved the Holy Spirit. Remake us again into your image. For your ways are kindness, tenderness, forgiveness. We long to live in love as beloved children, forgiven and free through what Christ has done for us. Amen. Hear the sound of the good news of your baptism. Friends, God's love is sure and steadfast. Receive the good news that in Christ you are forgiven and through the Holy Spirit you are strengthened to return to right relationship with God and with your own best self. You are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us share with one another the welcome and the mercy that we have each received from God. The peace of Christ be always with you. Hello, everybody. Hello. Peace. Peace to you, too, Peter. Peace to everybody. Peace, everyone. Peace. Peace. Hi, everybody. Peace be with you. And with hey, you. Bonnie. Did I hear Peter on there? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Bonnie. How are you? Hi. How are you doing? I'm cranking along. We're uh, just back from vacation, which was nice. Oh, that's good. Just to get away. Yeah. And you're all over COVID and all of that mess. No, still, I'm. Uh, oh, I've got an appointment yeah. with the long COVID folks over at Hopkins, so I'm oh my gosh, see how see how things go. 
Yeah. Oh, isn't that something? Yeah, it's crazy. We just um, talked to friends of ours, Julie, you know, and, and the Robinsons know, um, Sandy and Paul Dagdigian, and they're in Alaska visiting their daughter, and they're supposed to fly home today, but they all got COVID up there, and oh, Paul is really sick with it, and so they don't think they'll even be able to fly home today. I don't think they'll let them on the plane. No. Yeah. But Peter's really had a long siege of it. Oh, my gosh. Yep. I'm so sorry. Mm. Well, I'm hoping it's getting better. Yeah. Yeah. I rested a lot over vacation, which was nice. Oh, that's good. That's good. You need that. Yep. We also heard, and Robinson's and Julie, I don't think, Peter, you know her, but Phyllis McIntosh died. Yeah. Oh, sad. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just- ask if you knew sorry to hear that it is so sad she was in the hospital for test sandy had been to lunch with her on the 30th of july and she, phyllis was complaining about not being able to breathe and she said i'm going to have to find out what's going on and she went in the hospital for tests and then she died in there wow. i wonder if they ever yeah. figured out what it was and had she had know, but she knows she used to have a lot of lung issues yeah, I do remember that. Yeah. But it was a shock. It was a shock. So you nearly had the same news about me because I went into the hospital tomorrow, it'll be two weeks ago. And oh. they did tests. I came back with COVID again. Oh, and on top, now wait, you haven't huh. heard the good part. On top of that, they said you have fluid on your lungs oh. and they tapped. Two liter, two and a third liters of very ugly stuff. Oh, Jim, I'm you so look sorry. like you've lost some weight, Jim. Well, that helps. Yeah. <laughs> ones as well. If you're visiting well, with us, we want to say a special word of welcome. We also want to welcome folks on Zoom this morning. We're glad that you're here with us as well. We hope that you experience something of God's presence and peace in and through this worship experience today. Um, for those of you who are here, we hope that you'll join us for some refreshments in the at the back, in the front, whatever you want to call that, by the front doors um, following worship. And I understand there may be ice cream served as well. Ice cream. There may be ice cream served as well, just letting you know over there. Uh, so so uh, we'll look forward to that. Um, I'm excited to be back, too, after some really productive writing time away, so thank you for that. It's great to, great to be back. Um, there's a lot happening at Brown Memorial, so I encourage you to review the announcements at the back of your bulletin. I'll highlight a few things. One is that the retiree small group is not going to be meeting tomorrow, um, so make a note of it, those of you who are part of that group. Next Sunday, um, August the 18th, I will be hosting a, a inquirer's class for those of you who have been considering membership. Um, there's, it's not a pressure deal. You can come and we'll share a little bit together about the church and what it means to be a member of the church um, and give you all the information and answer your questions um, at that time. Also, later that afternoon, I'm the guest preacher at the Greater Harvest Baptist Church um, at 3.30. That's August the 18th, next Sunday. It's their um, service of Holy Communion and also their Men's Day service. So it should be a lot of fun. And I hope that um, some of you will just make church your entire day. Um, It'll be a lot of fun. And Greater Harvest, you may know, is a newer member of Build. And Brent Brown, who's my colleague there, has been a really great uh, colleague and friend to get to know. So it's an important institution in the Franklin Square neighborhood where we're really ramping up for a lot of our redevelopment efforts. So I hope you'll join me for some great fun and fellowship um, that afternoon next Sunday. On Saturday, August the 24th, there is river tubing at Harper's Ferry. So bring lunch for a 12 o'clock picnic, um, 1.30 departure time for tubing. If you have questions, see Eva over here. Um, She's an accomplished and experienced tuber and she can answer all of your tubing questions. 
Uh, Sunday, August the 25th, is an all-call music ensemble. What does that mean? Well, this is part of our uh, worship committee, uh, summer worship plans. You see, I, actually, as I got dressed this morning, I thought about my Aunt Eleanor, and I asked her one time about how she was enjoying her church in South Carolina, and she said, well, I really like our young preacher. I just wish he would tuck in his shirt. <laughs> Um, so this is part of our Worship Untucked experience. You can show up on August the 25th and sing in the choir. You don't have to attend any other rehearsals except for the one that morning. It puts the fear of God into our minister of music, but it brings joy into the hearts of those who participate and receive. So please put that on your calendar. We do need ushers for welcoming people on Sunday mornings. There is a sign-up sheet um, on the round table back here, uh, you don't need to have experience. We will let you know what to do, but if you're able to volunteer in that way, we would love it. Um, you, can, you don't even have to be a member of Brown. You can be a newer person and say, hey, that looks like fun. I'd like to contribute in that way. So please sign up if you'd like to do that. Now I'd like to invite Susan, there she is, Susan Stroop, for a special announcement. Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, my name is Susan, I think I know a lot of you. Uh, I'm one of the co-clerks of the session and also here today representing a small group of people uh, who is putting together uh, an event for a very special weekend. So if you have a bulletin, if you will turn it to the last page of the announcements, you can just go from the back cover and turn it like this. You will see a save the date announcement and that's what this announcement is. This is your invitation to save the date for Saturday, October 12th, and Sunday, October 13th. We are celebrating this year 20 years of our pastor, Andrew Connors, being here at Brown Memorial, doing ministry in the city. Yes, we can hear talk for that. So we've got a couple of groups who are working on uh, the Saturday event and the Sunday event. Uh, and the Saturday event in particular, because it's not a regular uh, Sunday church time, um, the Saturday event is going to be in the evening of the 12th, and we are going to host an all-congregation, all-ages celebration with a festive barbecue dinner, details to be determined, uh, and a roast and toast event to celebrate Andrew's ministry here at Brown and in the, in the city. Um, and then on Sunday, uh, the 13th, there will be special guests, Soulful Review will be singing to lead worship, so stay tuned for more information. We are going to send out an invite with an RSVP for the Saturday event, just so we know uh, how many folks are going to attend, and we're working on a lot of the details. But this is your notification. Save the date, put it into your calendar. Thank you. Sure how to follow that. <laughs> Roast and toast. Uh, be careful. All right, be careful there. Um, I do have a, a few prayer announcements to let you know about. Um, Matthew Stremba is home and can use our prayers. Um, and Barbara, as she takes care of him, he's at home after being in the hospital, after having surgery. Um, and then I learned this week that Phyllis, Phyllis McIntosh died this week. And uh, I think many of you know Phyllis McIntosh, who've been longtime folks here at Brown Memorial. She's deeply connected to this congregation in many ways, sang in the choir, um, was married to the longtime director of music and organist, Gene Belt, here. I don't have any more information at this point. I will let you know if there are any kind of arrangements um, to notify you about when I learn of them. I would ask you to see the prayer list at the back of the bulletin and keep those members of our extended church family in your prayers as you move through the week. Um, and it is summer, as you know, which means many of us are coming and going, including staff. And Gretchen will be on vacation this week, so try to remember not to text or call her with church business. Um, and Rachel will also be back in the office tomorrow. So now I'd like to invite the children to join me at the front. morning. We're going to play a game when everybody gets here. Um, so I think I'm going to face you this way because it works better as a circle. Good morning. Good morning. 
How's everybody? Having a good summer? Good. All right. Okay. All right. So I think it might be us. Let's see. Can I get a couple more adults who like to play games up here just so we fill it out a little bit? All right. So you can stand at the bottom. I don't want to. Yeah. Okay. Great. So this is a game, and it works like this. Um, there's a leader. There's a leader. And you do whatever the leader's doing. You do whatever the leader's doing. What's that? Kind of like Simon says. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Simon says, sort of like Simon says. So, but you just, you have to, whatever, whatever they do, whatever they do, you have to, you just have to start doing whatever they do. Just like this. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, you don't, you just do whatever they do. Okay, so does that make sense? Everybody got it? Okay, so here's how this is going to work. We are going to have somebody close their eyes. We're going to have someone close their eyes. And um, just one person. We'll choose who it is in a minute, or you can volunteer. And then while that person's eyes are closed, we're going to choose someone who is going to be the head honcho. The head honcho is the person who leads the whole thing. Okay? Does that make sense? So if I point to you and you're the head honcho, that means you get to come up with whatever we do and we will just have to watch Clara very closely and, but without really looking at her because we don't want the person whose eyes are closed when they open their eyes back up to know who the head honcho is and they have to guess who the head honcho is. Does that make sense? <laughs> Whew, I'm not very good at explaining games. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, who, wants to get, who wants to be the guesser? You want to be the guesser? Okay, so close your eyes. Close your eyes. And um, who wants to be a leader? Okay, you can open your eyes and then um, look around and you'll just have to decide. Mm. Good guess. Keep trying. Um, that game is all about a word imitation, right? Because we do exactly what the leader does. We try to follow exactly what they do. And the scripture today is a letter from the Apostle Paul, and he tells the church, I want you to try to be imitators, that same word, imitators of Jesus. I want you to try to look at Jesus and see what he does, see the way that he acts, see the way that he gives, see the way that he loves, and try to be just like that. So I hope that as you think about the game and imitating, think about the things that you see Jesus doing in the stories that we tell about him. Another round? You want to do one more round? All right, let's, <laughs> let's do one last round. Okay, who wants to be, who wants to be the guesser? Are you going to be the guesser? Do you want to, did you want to be the guesser or did you want to be the leader? Because if you want to be the leader, we, we would... The guesser. the guesser. Okay, guesser. Okay, so close your eyes. And it has to be a different leader than that. Yes, it def definitely has to be a different leader. Okay. Um, I think we have our leader. So if the, don't open your eyes yet, but the leader should go ahead and... Um, Change the yeah, do, do something a little... Yeah, so you can open your eyes now, and you, know, you can open your eyes. Okay, here we go. I'm 
getting tired. <laughs> Okay, let's have a closing prayer. Let's have a closing prayer. Thank you, God, for sending us Jesus to show us how to live and love and serve. Help us be good imitators of him. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys, so much. join me in prayer. Open our ears, humble our hearts, as we hear your word read and proclaimed today. Great God, may we listen, discern, and follow the path that you intend for us. Amen. The Hebrew scripture lesson this morning is from Isaiah 63, verses 7 to 17 reading from the Inclusive Bible. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church. I will tell you of the Lord's unfailing love and sing the praises of the Lord for all that the Lord our God did for us, the many things done for the house of Israel, which God did with motherly compassion and many kindnesses. For the Lord said, truly, these are my people, children who will not be false to me. And so God became their liberator. In all their distress, O oh God, you were distressed, and the angel of your presence saved them. You redeemed them out of deep love and profound mercy. You lifted them up and carried them from time immemorial but they rebelled, and it grieved your Holy Spirit. Then you became their foe. You alone fought against them. Then they recalled the days of old, the days of Moses and the people of Israel. Where is the one who brought us back up out of the sea with the shepherds of our flock? Where is the one who put the Holy Spirit among us whose glorious arm led them at Moses' right hand, who divided the waters before us and gained everlasting renown, who led us without stumbling through the depths like a sure-footed horse in open country, like cattle descending into the valley. The Spirit of the Lord gave us a place to rest. Thus you led your people and made for yourself a glorious name. Now look down from heaven and see us from your holy and glorious dwelling place. Where is your zeal, your strength, your burning love and motherly compassion? Why do you hold them back from us? For you are our mother and father. Abraham may not know us, and Israel may not acknowledge us, but you, O oh Lord, are our mother and father. Our Redeemer forever is your name. Lord, why do you let us wander from your ways and let our hearts grow too hard to revere you? Return to us for the sake of your children, the tribes of your heritage. The word of the Lord.
The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the fourth chapter beginning in the 25th verse, continuing through the fifth chapter and the second verse. So then, putting away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with your neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Those who steal must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor, doing good work with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is good for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Buried in this list of rules for communal living is a kind of an odd statement. Do not grieve, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not make God sad. Or, as the message translation puts it, don't break God's heart. It's kind of weird to talk about breaking God's heart since God isn't a person. How can God have a heart to break? Does God even have feelings at all? I'm guessing that most people would say no, including several of you who like to challenge me anytime I speak of God in a way that suggests that God has human-like characteristics. There is a long history in Christian theology of guarding against the human tendency to attribute to God things that seem more about us than God. The Westminster Confession of Faith, for example, describes God as infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible. In other words, the opposite of us. But Westminster goes on to describe God as most wise, most holy, most free. Basically, the human virtues that we cherish push all the way to their ideals beyond what is possible to achieve as a finite, flawed person. The trouble with describing God as basically the opposite of us on the one hand or the most perfect of us on the other is that in both cases we are still defining God in reference to ourselves. And what's more, the image of God that is described is often stripped of affect without passions as the Westminster Confession puts it. Yet, if you start with scripture about God, on the other hand, you often get a God very much with passions. Yes, God is sometimes described as totally other than us, but often God is the most emotionally available character in the room. Suffering moves God to action. Injustice deeply angers God. 
Love for God's people wrenches God's heart, at least if you trust the testimony of the biblical text. You get a God who experiences regret, changes her mind, loses her temper, softens his own judgment when he sees his children hurting, even when it's from punishments that they deserve. Now, I know that a lot of you definitely don't start with biblical texts. You rational brain forward types tend to think of biblical testimony as limited, especially by what you would call anthropomorphizing God, attributing to God human characteristics that God shouldn't have because God is, well, God. But what if the biblical text was more reliable than our Western philosophical ideas about God? What if the thick, layered testimony of generations of Yahweh worshipers and Jesus followers was actually more revelatory of the nature of God than the more individualized wisdom of Plato and his many descendants? If that were true, then it might mean that our human experiences of emotion, of feeling, of affect are not simply menial creaturely characteristics that belong to our lesser evolved selves but are part of the divine image bestowed on us by virtue of being created in the image of God and what if our own attempts to diminish the significance of feeling and emotions to render them less than the divine gift of rationality were mistaken attempts to denigrate a holy part of our humanity. I realize this is a very, very tough argument to make at a time in our country where strong emotions are, if not at the root of our division, certainly exacerbating them. And it's also a tough argument to make inside of any church community where emotions are almost always at the center of our biggest conflicts. The wish that I often have and that I often hear expressed by others is that if we could just remove emotions from our conversations, we would all make better decisions together. Bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling and slander and malice, these extreme emotions or emotionally driven actions named by Paul can indeed tear up any community. And yet, the recipe for putting them away isn't ignoring them, according to Paul. Anger gets a special kind of treatment. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. Anger, like any other emotion, according to Paul, is a given. He doesn't condemn it, maybe because Paul knows himself a little too well. The guy's got a temper. You want to see Paul's anger? Read the letter to the Galatians. He rips them apart. He even says at one point, I wish my enemies would castrate themselves. It's like flipping people the bird. Paul gets angry. Anger itself isn't a bad thing. In fact, it's often a great barometer for injustice, knowing when you or someone else isn't being treated fairly. But then again, sometimes it's just a cover for fear or grief, a cover that can blind us to our own self-righteousness and make it more difficult to be vulnerable for fear of being hurt again. Paul's admonition here isn't to banish anger. It is to make sure that it is not the single emotion that is driving us in the church. It should be the gauge on the dashboard of our living, not the driver in the driver's seat. It's Paul's focus on action itself that is particularly interesting to me. Speak truth to your neighbor. Why? Well, not because it's wrong to lie, but because we are connected to each other. We are members of one another. Give up stealing? Why? 
Well, not because it is against the law, but because if you aren't earning with your own labor, you'll never be able to be generous to those who are in need. Such odd and beautiful reasoning. The gift of community is one to be experienced, and lying and stealing gets in the way of that. Speak words that build up so that others can receive grace directly from your mouth. I have a right to say what I want doesn't really have currency when it comes to community, but rather I have the great joy of sharing grace with words that come from my own mouth. Be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving. Why? Because this is who God is. And Paul wants us to be able to experience that kind of divine love firsthand. The antidote to bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling, slander, and malice isn't trying harder not to feel it. Nor is it waiting for other people to take the actions you believe they ought to take before you are kind, tenderhearted, or forgiving. They're not kind to me, I'm not going to be kind to them. We've all had to work through this kind of difficulty in some sort of relationship before. And if the biblical testimony is accurate in its portrayal of a God as one who is moved by suffering, injustice, and heartache, then God has to work through this dynamic all the time. The Spirit grieves when we choose bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling and slander and malice instead of taking action that builds up. God must be grieving a lot of the time. But when we work through it successfully, we realize that taking these actions that build up, sharing words to offer grace, practicing generosity, embodying kindness, offering forgiveness, these aren't just actions that are good for other people. They are good for your own soul. In 1971, a, a team led by a psychology professor, Philip Zimbardo, ran an experiment dividing undergraduates randomly into two groups. And one group was told that they would be prisoners acting out their roles in a mock prison in the basement of the Stanford Psychology Building. The other group was then invited to be the prison guards. And less than a week went by before some of the prison guards started acting like authoritarians, humiliating prisoners. In turn, some of the prisoners fell into depressed states that caused such alarm that the experiment had to be halted after a total of only six days. Dr. Noam Spanser, writing about the experiment, points out that, quote, many people assume that the link between emotion and behavior is one way. Emotions shape behavior. You love him, therefore you kiss him. You hate him, therefore you hit, hit him. This view, he writes, is incorrect. In fact, the relationship is reciprocal. Much of the time, behavior actually shapes emotion. The guards in Zimbardo's experiments were not really guards. And the prisoners were not prisoners. They were all volunteers. They were all students. But once they began to act the part, they began to feel the part. That's Paul's focus here. Doing the things that contribute toward a more loving, grace-filled neighborhood inside the church and beyond it, doing those things helps us all feel more love. Practicing generosity helps us all feel more grace. Practicing kindness helps you feel more kind-hearted. And look, you can't be generous and grace-filled and kind all the time because, you know, people are sometimes jerks and sometimes they or we aren't even aware of it. God knows this. She has to put up with us all of the time. 
Yet in the broad sweep of the biblical testimony, notice that God doesn't stay there. God chooses not to stay angry and bitter. God chooses not to stay punitive and judging. And God doesn't wait on us to make that decision. God chooses to work through it, maybe because somebody's got to take the first step, or maybe because God likes to feel better as much as any of us, and sometimes the best way to feel better is to share love and grace and mercy even before it is shared with you. And so we are loved. And we are given gifts, and we receive mercy and kindness and community, and we are invited to imitate God and walk in that love, sharing the same with each other. You may be seated. We don't give because we have to, but because we can, and because it's a privilege, and because our lives are so full of blessing that sharing seems the only appropriate response. So in deep gratitude for this opportunity, let us offer our gifts.
Let us pray. God, we look at our humble offerings and we think that they may not change the world today, but they do help us to remember. We remember that you are generous. We remember that when we give our money, we mean we're giving ourselves. We remember that you working in us does change the world, making your dream for us more tangible on earth. Bless all of these gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to thank Susan for joining me. We're doing this in the name of Jonna Lazarus. She was scheduled to be here today. Um, that was on our annual schedule, but she's no longer able to do so. So prayers for Jonna, and we thank her for her grace and dignity. God, nothing is too great or too small for your loving attention today. You are the source of love, and we ask that you help us listen to that true voice inside us and follow the path of love. We also come to you with the sorrows of our heart, some we've been carrying for a long time, and others that are fresh and raw. We come with loss of every kind, and we know that no matter the size or situation you meet us in our need, may our spirits know the right thing to do. Source of mercy, we pray together for all those whose spirits, minds, or bodies are hurting this day. We pray, O oh God, for all those who grieve a loss of, in their lives, for the loss of health, the loss of a loved one, loss of security in their job or home or relationship, and for those in anxiety and distress. Be near to them and let them know that you are with them. We mention their names now, silently or aloud. Nancy Webb. Ellen Fisher. And we also lift up the names of those on our prayer list and those for whom no one prays. Bring comfort and relief to all who suffer anguish pain or grief, and to those who care for them, give tenderness and skill. May love surround them, and may we find ways to be that love. Source of wisdom, we come to you perplexed and surprised, confused and uncertain, searching for you in the wilderness of our lives, desperate for healing, healing in ourselves, in our city, in our country, and in our world. We ask for your healing touch and to teach us to perceive each other with the eyes of your son, Jesus, who brought together strangers and enemies, the disenfranchised, and those wielding power. Help us instead to serve each other as you taught us to serve. Source of wonder. The beauty of the earth and heavens is stunning, and we give you thanks for it. May we protect it and live in such a way as to provide future generations a habitable and enriching world. We pray for those in the world community facing oppression, challenges to freedom, and environmental dangers. We are reminded that so many face destruction and pain as a result of wildfires, floods, and tornadoes and pray for their healing in body, land, and spirit. Be a comforter, even as you inspire us to bold action, to protect your creation, and to show up for each other. Let us pray. Source of compassion, our world is immense, but person to person, it is small. We are separated by oceans, but it takes only a thought to make us one with another. We pray for our country that will find ways to have civil discourse with each other at all levels, in our families, our neighborhoods, our legislative bodies, and our leaders. We pray for the nations of the world, their leaders and people, 
and offer celebration for the world's athletes who celebrate the Olympic experience through their victories, challenges, and fair competition, and who have represented their countries with pride and grace. Our hearts are full of thanksgiving. Source of human connection, we give thanks that you have not given up on us, that indeed nothing can separate us from your love. We give thanks that even in our broken world, there is still much to thank you for. This morning, we celebrate and give thanks for the precious time we have spent with family and friends this summer, and for the exciting plans we are making for upcoming months. As many return, prepare to return to school, return to work, and embark on new adventures in fellowship. We pray for the opportunities of love, friendship, and fellowship. We take this moment of silence to give you our thanks and praise. Above all else, God, we give you thanks for your steadfast love, which never abandons us, and for the many blessings, both seen and unseen, in our lives. We are today in grace, love, care, and community, worshiping together in person and on Zoom, and celebrating an environment of respect and concern for everyone's health and well-being. With a grateful heart, we lift our voices as one, far and wide, Praying in the spirit your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. in your own lives, sharing kindness, being tender-hearted, extending forgiveness, and accepting it yourself. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, and among you, and between you this day, and every day of your gifted life.